The Art of Empire, Section 1, on War. Section 1A, The Four Types of Army. An army comprised of loyal volunteers, who are also well cared for, is invincible. An army comprised of loyal volunteers, who are not well cared for, will win with losses. An army comprised of drafted conscripts, who are well cared for, can win with losses. An army comprised of drafted conscripts, who are not well cared for, is already lost. By not caring for an army of loyal volunteers, one's soldiers will be reduced to slaves. Loyal volunteers fight to be victorious. Drafted conscripts fight to survive. Slaves will fight only for their freedom. Section 1B The Six Types of Soldier Section 1B A Slaves There are two types of slaves. One, one type of slave is not well cared for. This type of slave is worthless as a worker. This type of slave will spy on their master and sell their knowledge to their master's enemy. This type of slave will revolt with ten times the strength they exhibit at work against their master as soon as the opportunity to do so with assured success arises. This type of slave will see freedom as necessary to survival. 2. The other type of slave is well cared for. This second type of slave is especially skilled. This type of slave will serve their master unless promised freedom by their master's enemy. This type of slave will revolt only with the same amount of force with which they have been punished by their master. If the master is punitive, the slave will be encouraged to revolt. If the master rewards the slave, the slave will serve proudly. This type of slave prefers immediate survival to the promise of freedom. Section 1B B. Conscripts There are two types of drafted conscripts. 3. The first type of drafted conscript is a well cared for slave. A well cared for slave will fight willingly for two reasons the promise of freedom from slavery, or the expansion of their rights while remaining slaves. Of these two reasons, the former will motivate a slave who is punished more than rewarded, and the latter will motivate a slave who is rewarded more than punished. Well cared for slaves who fight willingly for their rights, if they are well cared for as an army, will win with losses against an army of loyal volunteers who are not well cared for. Well cared for slaves who fight for the promise of freedom will lose to an uncared for army of loyal volunteers fighting for rights. 4. The second type of drafted conscript is a citizen. Of citizens who can become drafted conscripts to form an army, there are two types. The first are citizens of the nation into whose army they are conscripted. The second are citizens of another nation than the one into whose army they are conscripted. If a citizen is conscripted by draft into their own nation's army, they will fight for the reason of their own personal survival. If they are promised additional rights as the goal of victory, they will fight to be victorious. If a citizen is conscripted by another nation than their own, they will fight to be victorious if they are promised freedom, but will only fight their own nation to survive. 
Section 1B C Volunteers There are two types of loyal volunteer. 5. One type fights for the expansion of their own rights. If a loyal citizen is promised additional personal rights for volunteering to their national army, they will fight for their own survival, because acquiring their additional rights depends on survival. 6. The other type fights for the expansion of the rights of their nation. A loyal volunteer fighting for the expansion of the rights of their nation will fight for the cause alone if well cared for, but will only fight for their own survival if not well cared for. Section 1C The Predictive Art of War The most invincible form of army is one comprised of loyal volunteers who fight to expand the rights of their nation and who are well cared for. Such an army cannot be defeated except in mutual destruction by an equal army. The most easily defeated form of army is one comprised of well cared for slaves who are not well cared for as an army. Such an army is only more effective than an army of conscripts from the enemy nation. An army of alien conscripts fighting their own nation will revolt if not well cared for. An army of uncared for slaves will revolt. By applying these rules to the composition of armies before entering battle, any army can be assigned a rate of probable success or failure against any other, and the outcome of any battle can be predicted before even being entered. The prediction of a battle's most probable outcome before it is entered is the most important form of strategy in the art of war. If a series of battles' outcomes can be accurately predicted, then one can advance through the ranks of the armies whose victory is most likely and can come to establish an empire. Just as the prediction of the outcome of battles is described within the sphere considered the art of war, so is the strategy of applying the accurate predictions made possible by studying this art considered a game of risk. If one applies the art of war in the game of risk, one will quickly conquer all. The ultimate result of the art of war is the ability for one to predict victory in any combat, and the application of this strategy results in one betraying any loyalty presenting an impediment to their own predictions of victory. Such a one as applies the art of war in the game of risk will find themselves among a shrinking group of traitors. Only by stabbing your last friend in the back can a safe empire be assured. Section 2 On Empire Section 2A The Bureaucratic Art of Empire However, once an empire is established by such as one who follows the art of war and who successfully applies its strategies, certain additional rules are necessary to understand for the maintenance of their empire. It is necessary, then, to apply the same rules to one's own loyal populations during a peaceful empire as are used in composing an army. The primary difference is that, while one deals with the compositions of armies to battle enemy nations, one is attempting to maximize the likelihood of victory of their own nation's army over their nation's enemy's army. In point of fact, the opposite is desired to maintain an empire. Rather than a strong army, the goal of empire is a weak population. In order to properly maintain an empire, one must build a population that is least likely to revolt. 
however one who is also least likely to achieve victory as an army. Therefore, to maintain empire, the population must be separated against one another, much the same way as in the composition of armies. However, instead of an army that can be mobilized against an enemy nation, the preferable form for an empire is a police force that can be utilized against their own national population. The traditional form of empire falls into the shape of a three-tiered triangle. The base tier is comprised of the population of citizens. The second tier, lesser group, is comprised of the national army or police. The third tier, the singular apex of the triangle, is reserved to the minimum possible number of the ruling elite. The composition of the police and the composition of the population must be balanced such that the police can effectively suppress the much larger population of citizens from revolt against the ruling elite. The composition of the police and the population must also be manipulated by the ruling elite such that, should the police and citizens combine to revolt against the ruling elite, their chances of success will be minimalized. The balance between police and citizens is one of brute force. The balance between the ruling elite and the rest of their population is one of strategy. Section 2B1 the composition of an empire. A population comprised of well-cared-for slaves and uncared-for citizens is best for an empire. A police force comprised of uncared-for slaves and well-cared-for citizens is best for an empire. A population or police force comprised of well-cared-for slaves and citizens will desire expansion of rights. A population or police force comprised of uncared-for slaves and citizens will desire expansion of freedom. If citizens that desire rights combine with a police force that desires freedom, they will revolt against the ruling elite. If citizens that desire freedom revolt, a police force that desires rights will combine with the ruling elite. The ruling elite cannot suppress a revolt by both the citizens and the police. That is why the balance between police and citizens is one of brute force. The ruling elite combined with the police can suppress a revolt by the citizens under certain specific conditions. If the citizens are equal or less in actual numbers to the perceived numbers of combined police and the ruling elite, then the revolt will be suppressed. If the citizens are equal or greater in actual numbers to the perceived numbers of combined police and elite, their revolt will be successful. That is why the manipulation of the population by the elite is one of strategy. If the perceived number of the ruling elite is equal or greater than the actual number of police, the police will side with the ruling elite. If the actual number of the ruling elite is less than the perceived number of police, the citizens will not be successful in a revolt against either. The number of citizens is always greater than that of the police, and the number of police is always greater than that of the ruling elite. It is only by manipulation of one group's perception of the number of another group that revolt can be avoided. It is only by manipulation of police against citizens that the elite can suppress a revolt.